is the 33rd message in a series on the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Learning some things in these messages. I hope you're learning some things. I've become more convinced than ever before since preaching these messages as I look backward over 32 messages past that the devil despises Christ and his cross. I don't think that I've ever experienced any more opposition in any series of messages I ever preached than I have in these past 32. Every message has been a battle, a great conflict of soul on my own part. And uh, I cannot explain it excepting by satanic intervention. It seems like each time I face the cross in an approaching message, there is a panic that makes me want to flee from it and to find myself in some more comfortable passage of scripture or some more comfortable subject. For indeed, the, the cross is, is a powerful message. It's the power of God and the salvation. And, and I think the devil will let us talk about anything religious. I think he'll let us talk about anything true and anything scriptural with a reasonable amount of peace, but he cannot stand that concentrated effort on the person and work of Christ. For Christ has crushed his head, and the work of the cross was the scene of the victory, and we're approaching that, and each message becomes increasingly more difficult. And I find that it's becoming increasingly more difficult for the assembly to receive the messages, as it becomes increasingly more difficult for me to bring them. So as you pray for me, pray for yourself, that you will have a desire to hear the rest of these messages, that you will not be overtaken with lethargy and indifference to the person and work of Christ. There are so many things in this life that bid for our time and our interest, the occupation of our minds, and for the most part, we are always defeated in this field. But let us gird up the loins of our mind and our hearts with real prayer, with real concern that God will, to use the worldly phrase, keep us near the cross. For well, that is a religious worldly phrase. Keep us near the cross. I find that I cannot preach on the cross without loving Jesus in a new way. I find that I can't preach on the cross without seen him as though I'd never seen him before. It just seems like each time, all new and fresh and real. And uh, this is the work of the Holy Spirit in bringing to our remembrance the things which he has said to us and sharing with us his things. And I don't think there's anything that delights the heart of the Father like believers dwelling upon the cross. It's good to discuss the find the points of Christianity and the intricate and complicated doctrines of the Bible because there are many. And it's good to have our heads full of knowledge about the scriptures and uh, it's good to apply in our lives and take to our hearts the great principles and truths that we learn in the scriptures. But indeed, I think the most blessed exercise of all is to continually come again to the cross. Paul prayed for his most spiritual children, the Ephesians, and his prayer for them was that they would know the height and the depth and the length and the breadth. And uh, he said in the Greek to have an experimental knowledge of the love of Christ. He prayed that they might be rooted and grounded in that love so that they wouldn't be moved. And throughout his writings and John's also, it is emphasized that the only place where the love of Christ was demonstrated that is, the full apex of that demonstration was the cross. And uh, I think there's a mistaken idea in uh, the religious world, at least, that we come to the cross, take one look, get saved, and we move on. We never come back to the elementary things, and we never come back to the primary truths. And we forget those simple things that we learn in the gospel, but not so. They're the most blessed truths we will ever learn. And uh, the most blessed scene we shall ever look upon is the cross. And uh, the closer we stay to it, the better Christians we will be. And uh, the more we will be like the Lord Jesus. For there we see his love. And we see him. 
And the part, I guess, that I don't like is that we see ourselves. It's the mirror that reflects us, what we are, and him, what he is, God, what he is, salvation, what it is, makes grace manifest for what it is. Just a good place to be, although it's attended with much agony from time to time as we go there. How can we look upon the Lord Jesus Christ at the cross without being smitten in our hearts with conviction over the fact that it was our sins that sent him death? So as we look again tonight, we're going to stay at the cross for a while because we have so much to deal with. He said so many things. All the things he said could probably be written on one of the palms of my hands when he hung on the Calvary's cross, but he said so many things for so many people for so long a time in those simple statements which he made from the cross. For instance, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Our words that have never ceased to be full of meaning for men from that time down until now. Verily I say unto you, this day shalt thou be with me in paradise. Has been a harbinger of hope to millions of people who have read those words and have had them impressed upon their soul by the Holy Spirit. He speaks from the cross, and he speaks not only from those who, for those who are there, but for we who are also there. For we are there, and uh, something rattles around in my mind and heart that I'll never be able to explain, but somehow, in the timelessness of God, and due to the fact that he, being in the fourth dimension, knows no time, we are always at the cross, and we always will be at the cross. The cross is eternity. The cross is now. And uh, it is the only hour and the only time God has recognized, God will recognize, and we will ever know throughout eternity. Before there was a world, before there was a universe, the cross was reality. And Christ was the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And when there is no more world and there is no more universe, and a new heaven and a new earth has replaced it all, the cross will still be a reality, and he will still be God's lamb, wounded as unto death, and yet living, never to die again. So when we're at the cross, we're in a good place, because that's where we're going to be throughout eternity. And I like that, don't you? Now, let us read in Matthew 27, verse 33. And when they were coming to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of a, of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall, and when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him, and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, quote, they parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots, unquote. And sitting down, they watched him there, and set up over his head accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads, and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders said, He saved himself, he saved others, himself he cannot say. If he be the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. I'd like for you to turn now to the Gospel of John. Because John tells the same story, only adds a detail which we will need for our message tonight. In John 19, blessed chapter, verse 23 says, Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier a part, and also his coat. And now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, who said, they parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus, therefore, saw his mother, 
And the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. So we find ourselves at the cross of Calvary. All history was fulfilled in the happening at the cross. All future happenings date from the cross. It was eternity in miniature, as I've already explained to you. And uh, in our last message, we left the Lord Jesus there, having arrived at Calvary. As you remember the physical suffering that he had already endured, we have reason to believe from the scriptures that he was not able to completely carry his cross to Calvary. I don't say that as a guess. I say it based on the evidence of the account given in the gospel. It says that they led him forth to be crucified. So we have the statement of scripture that when he left Pilate's hall, he was still walking, still under his own power and able to carry his own cross, for the cross was put upon him. And he was led away, carrying his own cross to be crucified. But before he arrives at Calvary, which was almost a mile, from the judgment hall. Simon of Cyrene is pressed into the duty of carrying the cross for the Lord Jesus, which indicates that it was impossible for him to continue on under the weight of the cross. Now the cross, I don't suppose, would have been terribly heavy, yet it had to be of sufficient strength and size to hold up a average man, and uh, I would assume that it would be two very good-sized posts much taller than a man, or was spliced together in the form of a cross arm. You know what a cross looks like. Now, there were three common types of crosses, one shaped like a T, one like an X, and uh, the common cross which has been adopted by the religious world with the top of the T dropped. And this apparently was the type of cross that Jesus was crucified on. And I say apparently because the only shred of evidence in the Bible is the fact that there was room over his head on the cross for a superscription to be fastened. And so we assume that it was on the common Christian cross, as we call it, that he was crucified. And this cross, the two pieces of it, lashed together, was placed upon his back and was a part of the punishment for condemned men, that they must carry their own cross to the place of crucifixion. Now, I don't think it was the cross that crushed him. Again, I repeat that the Lord Jesus, the only man who ever lived without sin, must have been a perfect physical specimen. He was a man in almost in the prime of life. He was 33 years of age. If any man could have endured that mile walk with a cross on his back, it looks like he could have, since he had at his disposal even the helpful ministry of a hundred million angels. For God had given his angels charge over him to bear him up in their hands, lest he dash his foot against a stone, so the prophet prophesied. Angels ministered to him in the place of temptation when in the wilderness and Satan so horribly affected him. Angels, I believe, were constantly watching over him throughout his earthly ministry and caring for him. And he could with a word have called twelve legions, though he would not have needed them. A word from the Lord Jesus would have brought heaven's greatest angel to have lifted the weight unseen by human eye of that cross and so enabled him to carry it to the place of crucifixion. But I believe that if there was anything that crushed him, it was not the cross. It must have been that crushing load which he knew he was about to bear upon that cross. For he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. The Lord hath laid upon him, Isaiah said, the iniquity of us all. I think he had a load that no man could see. I think he had that load when he started up Calvary. He had already received the cup. He had not drank it. It had not entered into him yet. But he had that load. The load was upon his soul with such agony in Gethsemane that his sweat appeared to be drops of blood. He was in such agony of soul that he despaired even of his own life, filled with terror, filled with stark fear as he looked into that cup which contained the mass accumulation of the sin of the world. What a load to carry. I think all of you people know what it is to be burdened. 
I think you know what it is to have a load upon your heart. We get under a load of trifles in this life. The little annoyances of this common life that we live. The aggravations, the friction of living with others. We get under the common irritations of a society that we don't particularly like. And they mount up sometimes, personal trials and personal problems. And before long, we have a load upon our hearts. And all of us know the agony of a burdened heart. No medicine can reach it. No doctor can diagnose it. Psychiatrists that are at a loss, they're frustrated. This agony of soul we all know well. Think of him who labored under all that we have ever labored under collectively. All the burdens that have crushed my heart and all the burdens that have crushed your heart and all the burdens that have crushed the hearts of all men everywhere of all time were laid upon him. And we think of this so lightly and we speak of it so glibly that I'm wondering sometimes if we really have any capacity to comprehend what Isaiah must have meant when he said he has borne our sorrows and carried our griefs. And the Hebrew says, like a beast, a burden. And whenever I read that word and understand its real meaning, I think of a beast of burden laden down with a load so heavy he can hardly get one foot before the other. And I think of my Lord burdened with all the accumulation of my life's burden. And more than that, for yours and every man who ever lived. And all of those sorrows, all of those griefs that have ever touched our hearts were laid upon him like a beast of burden. And he carried them all. And it's a staggering thing and a staggering load. And uh, it confirms one thing, that none less than God could have ever borne up under such a load as that. And if he was crushed and not able to go on, I don't think his problem was physical as much as it must have been the heart sickness that he felt as he went to Calvary's cross. Oh, not for the fear of death. He said, don't fear those who kill the body. But the heart sickness of seeing what man really was and not so much seeing it from man's standpoint as seeing it from God's standpoint. Seeing what man with all of his sin and sorrow had brought upon himself and brought upon God and I think this heart sickness, as I describe it for us, the only thing that could have, could describe what the Lord must have felt, must have crushed him. For Mark says that when they arrived at Calvary, it says, and they brought him to Calvary, and the Greek says they bore him to Golgotha. And it indicates to me that if they led him forth from Pilate's hall, but arrived bearing him, it must have been that he could have made it the last few steps of the way. Remember, he had experienced enough physical mistreatment to have killed many a strong man. He had been lashed, he had been smitten, he had been beaten, pummeled with the fists of men. He had been spit upon, he had been mocked, humiliated, ridiculed, despised and shamed. He had been made to carry that cross upon a bleeding back with a brow that had been crushed with thorns. Undoubtedly, his eyes were filled with tears and sweat and blood and spittle, where the soldiers had spit upon him. And here he comes to Golgotha. Golgotha is a place that I certain must hold some interest for you and must exercise your imagination a little. We hear beautiful songs about a green hill where he was crucified. But at the very best, geographers tell us that it was just a rocky crag and it wasn't really a hill and it wasn't really a mountain because there were just a rise in the rocks. And it was solid rock. There wasn't any green grass growing. There weren't any flowers blooming. It was just ugly, hard, craggy rise in the hillside of rock. It was a common place of execution. The word Golgotha is a Hebrew word. Translated into our language, it is Calvary. The meaning of the word Golgotha is a place of a skull. 
There have been lots of speculation as to why it was nicknamed a place of a skull, but I think the commonly accepted explanation is that this rocky crag resembled somewhat the shape of a skull, and so it became known to the people as the place of a skull, or the skull place, just as we nicknamed many places round about our home. And so to the skull place, to Golgotha, to Calvary, they brought him to die. Now, of course, he died in a very, very famous historical place. Palestine is very, very ancient. And uh, the forefathers of the Jewish nation had trodden that spot many times. And I've been curious to know exactly where Golgotha was. It's hard to really locate it because there's so much diverse opinion on the subject. But the very best students of Palestine are convinced that there were two things marked that famous spot. One is that it was traditional with the Jews to mark that spot as the buried place of another famous man. His name was Adam. And uh, it was common knowledge that Adam was buried at Golgotha and it was also linked with a very important incident in the Old Testament. For historians say that the place of Golgotha was as near as they can reckon, the same place known in the Old Testament scriptures as Gilgal. And so in going back to find out what happened to Gilgal, I found a little picture in prophecy again of the cross. There was only one man whose name was linked in history with Gilgal. His name was Joshua. And Joshua is a Hebrew word. And put into our language, it is Jesus. And he is spoken of in the book of Hebrews as that Jesus who led the children of Israel. Or that Joshua. And it's interesting to me that the only man linked with Gilgal was Jesus in the Old Testament. And the man linked with Golgotha in the New Testament is Jesus too. And so I looked back and I found that when the children of Israel had completed their wanderings in the wilderness 40 years of unbelief and sin and discouragement and oppression and persecution, they camped by the shore of Jordan ready to enter in to the promised land. And Joshua their great captain was about to lead them into the land that flowed with milk and honey. And they paused. And God said that they could not enter into the land until something had happened. He said that the reproach of Egypt must be rolled away. For in 40 years, there had been none circumcised in Israel. The things of God had been forgotten. They were not in covenant relationship with God, and they bore the mark of Egyptian bondage in their bodies. God said, not until the reproach of Egypt is rolled away will you enter into my rest. And so Joshua <laughs> called for the sharp knives. With these sharp knives, every male was circumcised in Israel. And God was pleased. And he said, now is the reproach of Israel rolled away. And he said, from henceforth he will call his place Gilgal. And there they camped and kept the feast of the Passover. As I thought of it in regards to Calvary, I see our Joshua, our Jesus, standing on the threshold of eternity, looking into a land that flowed with far more than milk and honey, with the eternal rest of God. But not until his people had known the judgment of Gilgal could a single one of them enter into God's rest. And there was where the sharp two-edged sword of the word of God circumcised the whole human race in the cutting off of Christ. And there's where the last Adam was buried along with the first Adam. And all we who died in that first Adam were made alive in that second Adam. 
and Calvary has become for us what Gilgal became for the Jew. It's become a sacred place, a place where the reproach of Egypt has been rolled away, and where we are eternally reminded of the Passover that was slain for us, even the Lord Jesus Christ. And this was this historic place where they brought the Lord Jesus. Now, it was a common practice. I laughed to myself when I read this. They tell me that the women of Jerusalem, <laughs> always intent on performing some little mercy, had for years made it a tradition to attend all of the executions. And you know, when it said the women in this uh, history book that I was reading, all I could think about was it must have been the ladies' age. Or must have been circle number one of the missionary guild or something. But they had taken on for their little project the traipsing out to all executions and showing a little mercy. So their little work of mercy was to bring with them a strong draft, a sedative, a narcotic drink, tranquilizer, if you want to use a modern word, to give to the condemned to ease their pain and to dull their senses and to prepare them for the great shock of crucifixion because the act of crucifying itself was a tremendous shock to the physical system, you can imagine. That. Now, you get in an automobile accident today and people go into shock. There are supposed more people suffering from shock than they are from uh, the actual effects of their injury. But anything of that nature, of such a climactic happening in the human body causes shock. And so these ladies came out from Jerusalem, and apparently they were the source of this drink that was offered to the Lord Jesus. You can picture the scene almost and fill in the details. They have arrived. He's not in very good shape. Here are the women. The soldiers are busy now. They're putting the cross together. It was just two pieces, you see, tied together the same way on Jesus' back. Now they are constructing the cross itself by lashing the cross arm to it. They didn't dig a hole. You couldn't dig a hole in rock, but they tell me that they had holes. They were already punched out with sputters in that rocky mountain or that rocky crag, ready for the posts of the cross. Now you often see pictures of the cross great high. Some pictures give you the impression the cross must have been 20 feet high, and he was way up in the air, but he wasn't. So the best Roman histories, giving accounts of Roman executions, tell us that the cross was just a little taller than a man itself. In other words, his feet was just off the ground enough to take the weight off his body, where he could see everyone about him, where he could, without even raising his head, see those who stood about his cross. And as they busy themselves preparing the cross, here is Jesus. And the women, apparently, came over, for this was established in history as the custom of the Jewish women in Jerusalem, with their sedative. Now it is described as vinegar and gall. Gall is a kind of a general term used to describe anything bitter. And Mark says it was wine and myrrh. He was a little more specific. And there's no confusion between the word vinegar and wine because all of the Roman soldiers carried a little flask of wine. You had to for your stomach's sake. The water wasn't fit to drink anywhere in the land. And they all carried a little sour wine with them in their canteens or what corresponded to the canteens in those days. And at the very best, it was just vinegar. <laughs> it was just a poor grade of vinegar. And so Mark says it was wine, or the vinegar wine, sour wine, and myrrh. Now, myrrh was a narcotic. And mixed together, it would have had the effect of heavy sedation, tranquilizer, in dulling all of his senses, and, uh, of course, easing the shock and the pain of crucifixion. I don't imagine they asked him if he wanted to drink. It doesn't say. Twice you call, he was offered drink. This is the first time. The second time while on the cross on the sponge on the end of a reed. I don't imagine they ask him. They just come up and here is the cup or the flask and they shove it to his lips and perhaps pour a little on his lips like you do with an injured man or a sick man. 
And the scripture says as soon as he tasted it, he refused to drink it. That's just a little thing. But to me, it was an outstanding thing. He could have taken that sedative. No one would have blamed him. But he didn't want to dull the pain. And he didn't want to escape the full fury of what must come. And the only thing that I can think of to help explain this little thing is that if you die without the finished work of Christ, no one will give you any sedation in hell. And you'll find no relief in narcotics in that outer darkness. And there will be nothing that will dull your senses or ease the pain. For you will weep and you will wail and you will gnash your teeth. And as Jesus said, you will gnaw your tongue in pain. He was my substitute. And he took there on that cross and he took there at the death of that cross everything that belonged to me. He speaks in the book of Revelation as the wrath of God poured out without mixture. That is, plain, undiluted, no mercy. And I read in Romans 8, 32, that God spared not his own son. Nor would he accept even the simple luxury of a sedation in facing Calvary's cross. And I, I'm not uh, drawing any conclusions from this, brethren. And I don't want to hurt the pill business. But uh, as I read it today, I hung my head in shame. Because I thought of us poor modern Christians. And every time our stomach turns over, or every time we get a little headache, we run for the pill bottle, run for the medicine cabinet, pick up the phone, call the doctor, oh, doctor, I have a headache, what must I do? What must I do? Oh, I can't stand the pain. Oh, I can't stand it another hour. I can't stand another hour. We don't even know how to spell pain. We don't even know how to spell misery and suffering. We don't know the first meaning of it, and we're not able to cope with the least amount of it. I think the understatement of the book of Hebrews must be where the Apostle Paul says, ye have not yet striven unto blood against sin. It's almost a mockery. It's almost ironic that he says it, you know, in kind of a sarcastic manner. He so strove against sin unto blood, refused even the luxury, something to kill his pain and to relieve his misery. Why? And uh, I'm going to leave this right where it is, because if I get to thinking too far out on this line, I get in trouble. He refused this sedation because he accepted Calvary and its sufferings as the will of God. And he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. You have ears to hear, now you hear that. We miss many a lesson of obedience. We miss many a lesson in the things God would teach us by the fact that we now have in our power the right to do as we please in our own bodies. That right he did not take. He accepted Calvary, I repeat. All of its pain, all of its suffering, and all of its sorrow as circumstances that had come from the hand of his father. And he expected in every moment of that circumstance to learn new phases of obedience unto his father and hence heap new glory upon his father. Now, I don't want to pursue that because I get mixed up. I just throw this in. I mentioned it to you before. There's times when I'm at a loss to figure out my Saturday nights, for instance. I can go to bed on a Tuesday night and sleep like a baby, or a Monday night. Many and many a Saturday night I lay and toss and turn all night long and can't sleep. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not sick. There's nothing oppressing me mentally or spiritually, just plain old-fashioned insomnia. 
And all the time I'm panicked. I'm laying there saying, I need my rest. And I need my strength. And I need my sleep. And here it is, 2 o'clock. Now it's 3 o'clock. Now it's 4 o'clock. And soon I must get up. And Sunday lays ahead. And whatever shall I do? And then the Lord's been teaching me something. He's been teaching me that since I can't control this thing, that maybe that's exactly what I need, is a sleepless night. Maybe exactly what I need is to be so weak I can't get one foot in front of the other, then I won't walk in my strength. Maybe exactly what I need is to be in such a state of affairs that I am in my desperation driven to the manifestation of the strength of Christ in my life. That I am pressed to walk in him where ordinarily I would walk in my own strength and in my own understanding. And I've been wondering if there are not times when we need to be, as I wrote, delivered unto death. That the life of Jesus might also be manifest in our mortal bodies. And we fight so hard against the good things the Lord would do for us and do in us, don't we? And we use everything in our possession to fight against him oftentimes in the precious experiences where he would teach us the miracles of his sustaining grace and his massless love. I know one thing about myself. I know that I am best prepared to preach when I look upon it as a hopeless task in the flesh. I am best prepared when I am my weakest, when I know the least, when I am the most desperate in my own heart. I am the best prepared to preach. For in that condition I am driven, I am forced, I am compelled to cast myself upon him. And finally driven to him like a Ship without a sail, derelict, driven on the sea. I find a safe harbor. I find rest, and I find strength, and I find quietness of heart. So here was the Lord Jesus, a simple thing. He could have taken the sedation, but he didn't. Think about it. He didn't. He refused it. It wasn't that he just couldn't drink it. He refused it. So I don't want it. Take it away. And they took it away. And then they crucified him. First, the criminal was laid, spread eagled on his cross. His arms were lashed onto the cross arm with leather thongs to keep the weight of the body from tearing the flesh, dropping off the cross. Sometimes they were kind enough I put a question mark after that. To erect sort of a pestle in the center of the cross for the weight of the body to set on, like a little stool, just a little board sticking out from the cross. And I say kind enough with a question mark because in thinking about it and hearing others discuss it, it only added to the pain of the crucified one for there was such a twist in his body and uh, such pressure upon the spine and the back that it only increased his pain, actually, rather than helped him. And so he was lashed on the cross. The feet were crossed. A nail driven through the feet, a nail through each hand. This was not to fasten him onto the cross with. He was lashed on the cross. It was a part of his punishment. It was to inflict pain. It was to cause him injury. It was to hurt him. And after he was nailed to the cross, men picked this cross up, thumped it like a fence post down into his socket, and there he hung until he died. Strong men have been known to hang three days and nights while the birds literally flew in and plucked the flesh from their bones and the eyes from their sockets. Many a man crucified by the Romans was left until there was nothing there but a bleached skull hanging on the cross. But it so happened that it was on the Passover Eve. And Israel didn't want their holy day profaned by a dead body being in evidence. 
So they wanted to hurry and get him dead so they could get him off of the cross and buried before sundown. And so when he was lifted up and crucified, his six-hour ordeal began, for he is just six hours now from eternal death. And as we begin this six-hour watch, which will take a number of weeks, I'd like to begin by a look at the spectators who were there. There was a great multitude, apparently, from all of these accounts gathered for the cross. Well, first of all, the herald went out, which was uh, corresponded to our Paul Harvey today. He was the news broadcaster that went out and told everybody what was about to happen. They didn't have any newspapers, they didn't have any radios or television. And the public executions were a treat. The people came from miles around, and especially to this one, because it was the time of the Passover. There were hundreds of thousands of Jews at Jerusalem, conservatively estimated at two million. From all over the Roman Empire had thrown to Jerusalem for the annual feast of the Passover. And the reports of this strange man, Jesus, had been spreading around for three years. He was infamous. His name was known to every traveler. That's the reason why the Emmaus disciples were amazed that this man walked with them and didn't know about what had happened. They said, are you a stranger? Well, everybody knows what's happened. That's what they were trying to say. And the reports of this strange man, Jesus, had been spreading around for three years. He was infamous. His name was known to every traveler. That's the reason why the Emmaus disciples were amazed that this man walked with them and didn't know about what had happened. They said, are you a stranger? Well, everybody knows what's happened. That's what they were trying to say. And so everyone had come out for the trial and for the crucifixion. It was certainly something special for the Passover that they should see such a noble person put it out. The infamous Jesus, the blasphemer, the false prophet, the pseudo-Christ, who had tried to fool the people into thinking he was the Son of God. Now he's about to be crucified, and the people have gathered to see him die. As I say, since he was just a foot or so off the ground, he could see the crowd, just like if I were standing on a little platform. I could see all of your faces. He could see them too, and the evangelists in the New Testament give a very vivid description of the crowd, and that leads me to believe it must be important, important enough for us to think about them anyway. First of all, it mentions in each account the soldiers. They were there. And as I think about these different persons at the cross, I cannot help but think that we are also there in one of these groups. We have to be. The whole human race was there. God had gathered the world there. Jesus said, And I, if I be lifted up, shall draw all men unto myself. And I know that somewhere in that crowd, I stood. I was still in the lines of someone there. You were there. You are there tonight. For well, the cross is now. We have some modern words today, which I don't quite know the meaning of, but it was a happening. And it was a now happening. And it will be happening for eternity, and we will be there for eternity, even those who die unsaved will face the cross for eternity. For the book of Revelation says they shall be tormented day and night in the presence of the Lamb and of his holy angels. The Lamb is not the king upon his throne. The Lamb is the Savior upon his cross. The Lamb is the wounded, dying Jesus. And you will always be there and you will be seen in one of these groups that I described to you tonight, the soldiers. What was their concern with Jesus? I'll tell you what it was. They had beat him back at the Pilate's, back at Pilate's place. They had smote him with their fists and slapped him with their open hands. They made the crown for him. 
they were prominent in the suffering, the physical suffering of the Lord. They actually inflicted the pain upon his body. They lashed him. They made the crown of thorns. They put the dirty officer's cloak on him. They stuck the reed in his hand. They mocked him. They spit in his face. And only God knows what other indecencies were carried out with his person while he stood before them naked and at their mercy. They prodded him up Calvary's hill, undoubtedly rebuked him for not being able to carry his cross. And when they got him there, it was their part to take the nails and the mouths and thump those nails through his hands and through his feet. They erected that cross and they left him there to die and they were a cool bunch. For just as quick as they got their work finished, they sat right down and began to dispense with his material goods. Now, I can't go into details to why we know all these things, but there's scriptural evidence for the fact that there were four men involved in this gambling game. There was a watch appointed over him, which always consisted of four men. These four men, according to Roman army tradition and custom, got the personal possessions of the criminal, whatever he happened to have on his person at the time of the crucifixion. Now you can't imagine there being any value in some old used clothes. But in those days, clothes, you didn't buy a certain robot. Clothes were handmade. And the garment, the cloak that the Lord Jesus wore, for instance, was a seamless one, very fine. Woven from the top without a seam throughout. My only guess is that it was knitted. Perhaps his mother, someone made it with love for the Lord Jesus. He had some undergarments, perhaps sandals, but this was actually his only possession of any worth was that seamless robe. And as soon as he is safely fastened to the tree, they sit down at the foot of the cross and it says, and they washed him there. And so they divided up the clothing. Here, you take this piece and I'll take this. You get the sandals. Well, what are we going to do about the seamless robe? Let's don't tear it up. That's too nice a robe to rip into four pieces. You see, cloth was expensive. Cloth, in fact, was the same as money. One of the soldiers said, wait, I've got a pair of dice. You thought dice were new? No, no, they're old. I've got a pair of dice. i tell you what we'll do with this roll for the robe. High man, take the robe. Here they are at the foot of the cross. Camp. Now there are still people there, like those soldiers, gambling. I see these people, I can't describe them to you. I can't say they are this group of people or that group of people, maybe you're among them. They didn't care a thing about the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. They weren't even touched with his sufferings. They couldn't care less about the why of his being there on that cross. They had no conviction about his innocency or his guilt. They had no interest in who he was or what he was. But there was one thing they wanted desperately, and they wanted it more than anything else. And they wanted his robe. And when they got his robe, they could sit right down at the foot of his cross while he died and couldn't have cared less. I see these people. Everybody wants Jesus' robe. Everybody wants his righteousness. Everybody wants to go to heaven when they die. And a lot of people think they have gotten his robe. And after they seemingly get it, they sit down at the foot of his cross and they couldn't care less about him. You ever think about people like that? Yeah. Glad they're going to heaven when they die. Glad they've got his robe. But they have no more interest, no more concern, and no more understanding of he himself. Not a look of mercy, not a look of compassion. 
Not a word of comfort. Not a bit of intercourse is described between these soldiers and that dying man. He is as though he were a dog in their sight. He is ignored. He has no part in their lives. He is not consulted. He is not questioned. He isn't even addressed. They sit at the foot of his cross after acquiring his robe and go on as though they had never heard tell of him. And I see people like that. They get converted, so they say. They're sure they have his robe now. They're going to go to heaven when they die, and they come to church and they tip their hat and pay their respects to God. But they know no more about the Lord Jesus Christ than they ever knew and care less about him. There is no intercourse between their hearts and him. There is no word of love, of mercy, compassion, or comfort ever passes between them and him. He is as though he were simply a dog. And God forbid that there should be any of you with those soldiers tonight. Because you're gambling just like them, but you're gambling for a lot greater stakes. They got the robe all right, but you know, I imagine that robe turned to rags in their hands. And time deteriorated it, and morals corrupted it, and one day it was nothing, and someday that robe you imagine that you have may turn into the same rags, the same filthy rags you've always had. You just imagined for a while that you had a robe that was of value. For salvation is not as simple as acquiring a robe. Salvation is falling in love with a person. It was sure obvious that these soldiers didn't have any love for Jesus. Then there was another group at the cross, too. The passerbys, I call them. We'll have to deal with these quickly. They passed by. They just dropped by to take a look. They were interested enough to come out and see, but not interested enough to offer any words of encouragement to him or to help or to inquire or to go into the matter more deeply, just interested enough to drop by and see what was going on. But after they came, they did engage in the little game of reviling him and wagging their heads. You know what it means to wag your head. Wag your head, that's what it means, isn't it? Just like a dog wagging his tail. And here they come, just passing by. Why, you said destroy the temple and you build it again in three days. This is what they said to revile him. Now, if you're really the Son of God, they said, come down from the cross. There were three things these passerbys, in wagging their heads and in their reviling, did. First of all, they misquoted him. And all I want to tell you, they never died back there. Their descendants are still with us. The only thing they ever get done is misquote the word of God. They started out by saying, you said... If you destroy the temple, I'll build it again in three days. He didn't say that at all. He said, if you destroy this temple, I will build it again in three days. So they misconstrued everything he said, misquoted everything he said, and the second thing they did was minimize his death, and the third thing they did was mock his deity. If you be the Son of God, come down. Minimizing his death. They didn't have any more understanding about his death than the hog has about Christmas. They didn't know who he was. They didn't know what he was dying for. They didn't know why he was hanging on that cross. And they didn't care. And they didn't believe he was the Son of God. They mocked him in saying, If you be the Son of God, come down. If he'd have come down, their eyes would have bugged out. You could have scraped him off the stake. They never had the slightest guess he would ever come down from the cross. This they said to taunt him and to add to his misery. Why don't you come down? You're the son of God. Come down. Come down. You said, quote, and then they misquoted him. 
We have people like this today, the passers-by. We get them in the assembly. They pass by in the assembly. They come in and interested enough to see what's going on, interested enough to hear a message on the cross, just interested enough so they can wag their heads and go out and revile and misquote what they heard from the Word of God and minimize the blessed substitutionary atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ and cast doubt upon the very deity of Jesus in so doing. And they're passing by. One comfort is that they're not only passing us by and passing him by, they're going to pass right on by into eternity. And they'll still be wagging their heads when they're in hell. But they won't be misquoting the word anymore. Then there were those people called simply the chief priests and rulers. I refer to them collectively as the Sanhedrin because they were there in force. They wanted to witness this thing to the last end. They wanted to make sure Jesus died. Who were they? Well, I'll tell you who they were. They were believer, believers in the Bible. They were Bible readers, Bible students, and Bible toters. You ever hear of a thing called phylacteries? Well, you weren't the first to carry your Bibles. Phylacteries were portions of the scripture bound in leather cases on their wrists and on their foreheads. Wherever they went, they toted the Bible with them. And they were Bible students, and they didn't hesitate to let anybody know they were independent, fundamental, evangelical. Conservative, separated, unaffiliated, undenominational, and everything you can think of, all the good words. They were the good guys. They must have wore white hats. They did wear white robes. And if they touched a Gentile, they ran home and washed them for fear of being contaminated. They went daily three times to the temple to pray. They wouldn't have missed it for anything. They raised their hands in the presence of God and say, I tithe always, I thank God, I'm not a woman or a Gentile. And one of them praying looked around and saw a publican in the center standing by and he said, I thank God I'm not as that man. They were the religious. Now you would think that these good guys would act like good guys at the cross. You would think they'd be the most behaved the best behaved, and you'd think that they would be solemn and dignified, wouldn't you? And you'd think that they would stand back with their hands crossed and at least show some mock respect in the presence of his dying man. But they were the most ill-behaved of all the people who came to the cross. They couldn't leave him alone like a pack of dogs with a dying animal at bay. They kept running into his cross and jeering at him. And as they came into his cross to mock him, they cried out, Save yourself! Come down from the cross! Look at him! He saved others, but he cannot save himself! He cannot save himself! Twice they said it. And I like the fact that God will even speak truth through Balaam's ass if he don't have anybody else to preach through. And he preached a mighty message through the mouth of those infidel Pharisees. Let me tell you, brother, preach on that text sometime. He cannot save himself. There's a text. For no true words were ever spoken. He could not save himself. He was committed to the death of the cross. He couldn't save himself. They didn't know it. They thought they were heaping coals of fire upon his head. He had already said it. Except in grain if we fall into the ground and die. It abide alone. He couldn't save himself, or had he saved himself, we would have been lost. What a blessed text. He saved others. Himself he cannot save, for if he saves others, brethren, he cannot save himself. There is the substitutionary atonement, one of the most glorious texts in the Bible. He saved others. 
himself he cannot save. Why? If others are freed, he must die. Yes, they are just like that today. They want a crossless religion. The professing Christian world, the Bible-toting, Bible-reading, Bible-quoting people today would be tickled to death if they could get away from the cross of Christ. They like to preach about the master and the teacher and the great Nazarene and the gentle Galilean. And they like to wax eloquent on his philosophy of life, dwell long and eloquently upon his Sermon on the Mount and his Beatitudes, and these great ethical teachings that fell from his mouth. But all oh, my brethren, they don't preach his cross. For his cross is an offense, his foolishness to them that perish, to us who believe it is the power of God. And so they're with us today. And then there was that group that Luke says they came and they looked and they smote their breasts and they returned. They didn't spit on him and they didn't revile him. They didn't taunt him. They didn't say anything, they just looked. And they smote their breasts, which was a sign of mourning, sorrow. And they returned. We have those people today too. They're interested enough to come and see. And they see the cross. They hear the gospel. They get a taste of the word and they are smitten in their hearts. They are touched. They are concerned with what they see and what they hear. But the trouble is, they just run home and forget it all. They turn the television on and they not think about that horrible sight they saw outside the city there tonight. And I imagine if they'd had TVs in Jerusalem, they'd all been on that night. Because these lookers wanted to do one thing, get it out of their minds, get it out of their hearts. Yes, they were upset while they were looking. I see them. I watch them. You do too. I make contact with a person and there's concern and there's interest. And they're willing to look. And you unveil the cross and you show them. You show them what sin is and you show them what Christ is. And they look, and oh, they're smitten, and they smite their breasts. And they feel sorry for Jesus. And they feel sorry for their sins. And they're all emotionally upset at the cross, but the trouble is, quick as you're out. We're sorry that this message is incomplete, but due to the length of the original tape, the last few minutes of this message could not be recorded.